Welcome everyone to the third and last keynote lecture of Islampa Exchange on once more a very relevant perspective and hot topic, syndemics. But first we will announce the Islampa Journal Awards. Good morning, afternoon, evening or maybe even night. It's my pleasure to present to you today the 2021 award winners for the International Journal of Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity. We start with the citations award for papers that were published in 2018. The papers that had the most citations in Web of Science early April of this year are the ones that won the awards. We have awards for four different categories, intervention studies, methodological studies, observational studies, and review studies. And the award for the intervention study goes to Jennifer Norman and her team on the sustained impact of energy dense TV and online food advertising on children's dietary intake within subject randomized crossover counterbalance trial. And the award winner for the methodological study was Harriet Kortz and her team on the implementation and scale up of population physical activity interventions for clinical and community settings, the practice guide. The winner for the observational study was David van Kempfort and his team on sedentary behavior and depressive symptoms among 67,077 adolescents aged 12 to 15 years from 30 low and middle income countries. And finally, the review award goes to Kieran Dowd and his team for a systematic literature review of reviews on techniques for physical activity measurement in adults, a daddy pack study. Many of you do high quality reviews for us every year and that's one of the reasons why we have the reviewer awards uh, every year um, this is just to put some of you in the spotlight who've contributed uh, substantially to our journal in the number and the quality of the papers but of course there are many more reviewers that did an excellent job last year and there's so many of you that we would really like to put in the spotlight nevertheless the winners for 2020 are Jasper Schipperijn, Stuart Biddle, Tom Stewart, and San Gao. Many thanks to them and all the other reviewers for doing so many good reviews for us in 2020, and we hope you will keep doing them for us this year. That brings us to the end of the Journal Awards, and I want to leave you with two messages. Please keep doing high quality reviews for us, and do send us your best work. Their journal is really success because of your contributions. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, winners. And um, for more awards, please keep an eye on the conference notification system and our social media channels. And don't forget to engage in the Dancing Monkey Challenge. This challenge will be open until the end of June. So you have plenty of time to look for them in all the presentations. But now the keynote lecture, in which we will learn whether COVID-19 is a syndemic or not, or maybe perhaps sometimes or somewhere. I welcome our third keynote speaker who led a series of highly recommended and insightful art articles on syndemics in The Lancet. She's a medical anthropologist and professor at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, and has published widely at the boundaries of anthropology, psychology, medicine, and public health. She's the inaugural co-editor in chief of Social Science and Medicine Mental Health. And in 2017, she was awarded the George Foster Award by the Society of Medical Anthropology. She danced around the world doing her research, described in her books about which we will hear more during her lecture, including Rethinking Diabetes, Entanglements with Trauma, Poverty and HIV, Syndemic Suffering, Social Distress, Depression and Diabetes among Mexican immigrant women, and global mental health, anthropological perspectives. This fall, her newest work was, will see the light, Unmasked. Unmasked is a cultural and political commentary on how a small town in Iowa responded to the global crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. Dear Ismanpa audience, although we cannot see you, please join me in a traditional standing applause for Dr. Emily Mendenhall. Hello, um, I am Emily Mendenhall. I'm a medical anthropologist and professor um, in the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. 
and it is a privilege to share this virtual space with you um, today. Unfortunately, it's not as interactive as I would have liked, but um, I am really looking forward to sharing this work on syndemics with you. I've been working on the concept of syndemics for over a decade, and more recently, some of the relevance um, and salience of thinking syndemically has come to the forefront with COVID-19. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my work um, before the emergence of COVID, um, as well as how it's relevant today. What is syndemics? This term keeps coming up um, in public health, in the public domain, um, in clinical scholarship. So syn syndemics bring together the idea of synergy among multiple epidemics. Syndemics are embedded within this larger idea and framework of epidemic. So syndemics are related to the study of diseases, not only across the population, across the world, um, or within a population, but syndemics are looking at the convergence or interaction of two or more diseases within a population. And it's important to point out here that syndemics are locally driven. Syndemics are not related to pandemics. They are related to epidemics. And the reason why it's important to emphasize that syndemics look at um, the convergence of diseases within a population is because syndemics take seriously the drivers of those conditions. And by thinking about syndemic in, in global terms, it erases the local histories and politics um, and ecologies that drive diseases to emerge and cluster together. Um, so what makes a syndemic? I usually work within three rules um, to identify if something is syndemic. But many scholars of syndemic think in terms of disease concentrations and disease interactions. So I generally start with the first idea, looking at the epidemiological literature and think about, do two or more diseases cluster together within a population? The second rule of syndemics is thinking about their interactions. So do conditions interact at the biological level, at the psychological level, biobehavioral level, or social level. And often when we think about social interactions, we think about stigma. So how does one disease become imbued upon another? And this is something that I found um, across my work, specifically in Nairobi and Johannesburg, and how people thought about and disclosed their diabetes um, diagnosis, which often was imbued with um, pre-existing stigma around HIV. So that is one way in which diseases become um, interactive through stigma. There are often uh, very much more clear and documented ways in which biological and psychophysiological links um, exist within conditions, especially cardiometabolic diseases. And the third, um, th third rule of syndemic theory is thinking about what structural or social or ecological factors precipitate this clustering of diseases. So the, so the conceptualization that there are similar origins, um, maybe they are political, macro-social, um, economic, or even ecological changes that are behind the emergence, the historic emergence and persistent clustering of multiple conditions. Um, I led a series of papers in The Lancet in 2017 um, 17 on syndemics, and this um, model, this figure here, model of a syndemic, was in the first paper led by the architect of syndemic, syndemic theory, um, Merle Singer. Now this model just kind of simplifies it to the bare bones, where you think about the fact that these two diseases or more are, are interacting, which create an adverse interaction that further enhance disease transmission, prog um, progression, or negative health outcomes. So it, it, the idea is the syndemic itself makes people sicker. Um, I came to this work thinking about diabetes among Mexican immigrant women, which I will talk about in a minute. But what I found by asking women about their diabetes is they wanted to talk about their social trauma and how this became embedded and imbued in their depression um, and, and un chronic untreated depression and anxiety that had um, a profound impact on their social life, their mental health, and their diabetes. So I argued that you can't think about diabetes itself um, as causing women, these women I interviewed, to be sick or, or um, to experience sickness or suffering. In fact, it was the interaction, it was the syndemic itself. So putting the syndemic at the center of how we understand 
sickness and health is really important. Um, and of course, all of these, these interactions are embedded within the clustering diseases, which are embedded within these drivers that perpetuate and cultivate um, risk and infection or the development of a non-communicable disease. So the first paper about syndemic thinking was um, written by um, Merle Singer, the architect of syndemic theory, who is a medical critical medical anthropologist and was working with the Hispanic Health Council in Hartford, Connecticut. He was working in, um, in a clinic doing research, applied research, trying to enhance and understand the AIDS crisis of the inner city um, in the United States at the time. And what he came to find is that his work, his intervention work, but also his theory and his ethnography could not be understood by HIV alone. And he argued that to understand HIV, um, the HIV crisis in the inner city, you had to really take seriously substance abuse and violence that was imbued with and perpetuating HIV infection and the experience and stigma um, and, and strife linked to living with the virus itself. So Merle Singer, um, or organize this idea of SAVA, substance abuse, violence, and AIDS, the SAVA syndemic, um, as embedded within these, these broader um, histories of structural violence, of uh, family and social networks that break down or build up or complicate the, um, people's lived experiences, early life experiences that are carried with you and become embedded in, in, in long-term distress, and negative social and health con consequences that thereby can create a negative feedback loop in which people experience different degrees of um, disease and suffering linked to HIV. So in this way, if you're um, within this one community in which he was working in the inner city in Hartford, he argued that um, thinking about and understanding HIV cannot be dissociated from people's lived experience with violence or substance abuse. And so these tripartite interactions become embedded in what he called the Savas endemic. And the Savas endemic has grown legs of its own and has been the center of how many people think about HIV and substance abuse around the world. Now, it's important to remember that, of course, people have been um, extensively studying HIV and, you know, people have um, scholars have um, expanded by by now um, well beyond HIV, but the the large majority of pro um, research on syndemics itself is on HIV, not only because of um, Singer's early focus on it, but because it has had such broad reach and such extraordinary funding to do the scholarship. Um, but the argument, of course, through this work is that by intervening in harm reduction policies and clinical practices, you can enhance for substance use, for example, for injecting drug users, for example, you can enhance and, and prevent HIV transmission, enhance the lives of people, people living with HIV. So different interventions at the clinical, social policy, community level can have a profound impact on violent substance abuse and HIV separately, as well as their interaction. And it's really important to think about what these interventions can do. However, as the work on SAVA has demonstrated, is that people do not experience SAVA similarly everywhere. And in some cases, SAVA does not hold true. Um, that everywhere HIV is does not mean SAVA exists. But in fact, across context, thinking about the experience of HIV is contextually situated. And in some cases, when SAVA does exist, the pre-existing and perpetu perpetuating social and experiential um, economic um, political factors, ecological factors differ. And it's important to recognize that and really take seriously the theoretical framework, but understand that it is not a one-size-fits-all theory. I came to this work when I was working, as I mentioned earlier, on diabetes lived experiences in Chicago. I was working at the old Cook County Hospital in the General Medicine Clinic, and I started asking women first in their homes and then in the clinic how they how they got diabetes. And I came to listen to long, extensive um, life stories about trauma, about trauma from childhood, about um, trauma from early marriage, um, from migration, from living in fear um, that one would be um, incarcerated because of um, documented, undocumented, undocumented status of themselves or loved ones, um, of loving and, and, and missing family in Mexico, um, and, and also, of course, diabetes, especially advanced diabetes, and um, a chronic untreated depression, in some cases, um, symptoms of anxiety and PTSD. 
And what I came to know, although I started asking about diabetes, is that their stories and their histories were well beyond diabetes and you could never get to the heart of their experience by just focusing on diabetes and by just getting to understand and mitigate the physical illness was incomplete. Attending to physical illness um, in some ways masked the deep, deeply rooted social psychological trauma that many women carried with them. Um, of the women I interviewed, um, 23 experience, 23 percent of the 121 women, uh, um, 23 percent, um, it's uh, shared a pretty extraordinary experience of um, uh, sexual violence. Um, 54 reported some sort of physical violence, um, often um, during childhood, um, and then um, about 60 percent uh, reported some type of emotional or verbal um, abuse. And it's important to recognize that these experiences, when become chronic, heighten cortisol over the life course. And there are multiple psychophysiological links between heightened cortisol, constant microaggressions and um, distress that work on your body at the cellular level to become insulin resistant. So there is also a pathology here, a psychophysiological link between the social distress from someone's personal social life that becomes embedded and imprinted in the body and reflected in the clinic in diabetes. Um, I think one of the most powerful uh, reflections of why taking seriously how women get disease, get diabetes and what may be the most effective um, intervention is a woman I met, Maria. I, I interviewed her a couple times. Um, and I, I spoke with her multiple times, but I interviewed her in 2007 and then again in 2010, we spent about three hours together. Um, and, and during the first interview, she had pretty extraordinary um, depression. It was, um, it, and she also expressed suicidal ideation. She discussed um, a, a rape during childhood from a family member. She has discussed only telling one family member about that during her entire life and keeping it close, but having rumination and um, also recurrent um, dreams about that experience. She also talked about living with an abusive husband and had um, poor diabetes control. In many cases, women who had poor di diabetes control and reported symptoms of depression, the, clinic would, the clinician would then respond by giving them an antidepressant. But in this case, in many cases, that didn't help. They said, let's give them an antidepressant. You know, I'm overwhelmed. I don't have time to spend with this patient. Let's, let's treat the depression so they can treat the diabetes. But what happened is it masked the root cause of their distress and their trauma and their memory and their, their traumatic nightmares, which also affected their sleep, which we know is also further complicated and tied to diabetes. So with Maria, for example, and many women, um, but especially women who expressed suicidal ideation, I walked across um, the hall, across the clinic to the psychiatry department, and there were two Spanish-speaking um, counselors. And I was able to um, help her through all the paperwork and set her up with a counselor. And when I saw her three years later, she told me she had met with a counselor for two years and gotten to the heart of her trauma. She had no depression. She had um, well-controlled diabetes. She'd left her husband. She'd gotten a job um, and she was happy. She was doing well. Um, and she um, had this revised narrative that was really based on this kind of idea of flourishing. And her story made me um, so impressed with the power of counseling and the power of, you know, okay, if you want to treat physical illness, sure, get to the root of mental illness. But it's not just over a medication when, when the problems are deeper um, and, you know, within the soul and soul rattling that women carried with them so deeply. Um, it really takes more more deep um, uh, attention to the mind and body um, to help women overcome that. So I found that to be such an important narrative of how to care for um, syndemic experiences. So this um, visual just demonstrates how complicated and interactive um, all of these complicated features are. So if we want to complicate, you know, what causes diabetes? Well, poverty causes people to eat on the quick, um, you know, especially when you have multiple jobs, um, to eat diets that, you know, drum up against clinical recommendations that aren't realistic. Um, also, it, they, it increases stress, chronic stress, everyday stress. I've interviewed people around the world um, who are low income with diabetes and not one person has told me that financial distress doesn't affect their everyday life. 
of financial stress is a, just a chronic undercurrent of, of lived experience. Um, increased stress and, do, and, and body weight, um, both cortisol, but also adiposity, cent centripetal adiposity especially, um, contributes to diabetes um, itself as one pathway, of course. And increased poverty and stress increases um, likelihood of depression, anxiety, um, traumatic memory. Um, and depression also contributes to diabetes biologically, psychologically, and behaviorally through, um, you know, eating to suppress feelings, um, you know, the cortisol pathways. Um, and it's uh, really important to think about these critical ways in which then also diabetes can, um, you know, living with chronic illness. And often I find the fear of amputation, and that's often linked to the fear of unknown or having a loved one who you know and you've cared for a very for a very long time have diabetes and you've seen deteriorate. And that kind of modeling can, and can cause a great deal of distress in the individual who's recently diagnosed. And then also depression and diabetes co-occurrence compromise social dynamics and economic security. Um, in the United States, our greatest shame is that medical bankruptcy is the cause of greatest cause of bankruptcy in the United States. So this, of course, causes um, a profound influence. A woman I spoke with who I call Beatrice and I've written about um, in my most recent book, Rethinking Diabetes, lost her house because of her diabetes, because her medical bills, they were, this was before the ACA, and their medical bills um, were so high that they, um, that uh, they couldn't pay their mortgage and they lost their house. So it's pretty extraordinary to think of the chronic um, financial insecurity that can come from living with chronic illness without secure medical care. Um, and also, of course, there's this gender dynamic that has come up actually everywhere I've worked, where women often talk about not caring for themselves or adapting their diet when they themselves are living with diabetes. Um, but of course, they do for their children if they're diagnosed or their spouse if they're diagnosed. Um, so this kind of longstanding trope of, of the maternal sacrifice is something that I found um, that women often do in caring for um and not caring for themselves, but caring for others. So this is something to also think about. So then I traveled, and I'll just talk about this briefly, but I spent a year in India and then in South Africa and Nairobi looking at what it looks like to live with diabetes in, in other contexts, to be poor with diabetes in India, for example. And I found that I looked at um, high and middle and low income people living with diabetes and the, chronic, the chronicity of poverty, um, the experience and stress um, of financial burden, and also the kind of lack of familiarity with diabetes. As when I did this research in 2011, it was just increasing um, among low income people, maybe not biologically, but um, in the social world. People were really talking about what it meant um, and how it in interacted somewhat with other infections or other problems, and especially infections like TB. Um, and I found people with diabetes who were low income were more likely to be diagnosed later, were more likely to have more chronic distress and depression and untreated depression, um, and more kind of family discourse and financial um, strife, which was not surprising, but um, was also something that is important to think about because living with diabetes and um, and being poor is a really different experience than having secure medical care and, and confidence about where your next meal will come from and that you can manipulate your own diet for yourself and others, for example, um, or, your, or your everyday stress. Um, my work in Soweto was, of course, different than Nairobi, but there were some similar findings that um, because people are quite familiar with HIV um, and in both contexts, which I found to be really interesting, um, faith healers had tried to kind of um, stamp out HIV stigma by saying, you know, well, diabetes and cancer, or HIV is the same as diabetes and cancer, you know, let's accept these, these virus or this, this virus as um, any other kind of chronic condition. But what happened, and I actually did a, a study on breast cancer in Swoil as well in South Africa, and I found that people actually um, didn't want to disclose their diabetes and, and then their breast cancer because it was imbued with HIV stigma, which creates a complicated social life of the virus um, that affects how people talk about it and then care for themselves. So it's a really important thing to think about. Um, now, in, in, in South Africa, in Johannesburg and Soweto specifically, um, people on public um, health insurance were able to access diabetes care, um, diabetes medication. Now, in Nairobi, where um, a large part of um, health funding is through um, global health agenda setting and don donors. 
Um, a lot of the money comes from PEPFAR and at the hospital where I worked at, Bagathi District Hospital, there was a huge and, and beautiful new HIV unit, um, but all of the diabetes um, or specialty patients uh, sat at outside in, um, in a small specialty care unit. I'm next to people with TB and cancers and other kind of chronic conditions um, where they were able to seek care. Um, but a lot of people, as, as, a, as a result, um, actually had to pay for their own clinical visits for diabetes and other conditions that were not HIV, TB, malaria. And they also had to pay for their own medication. And many people said, look, I only I don't test my diabetes because I have to pay for the strips and I have to you know, constantly pay for this, this burden, this financial burden. But I also don't um, take my medication unless I feel bad. And, you know, I always take my HIV meds. The people I spoke with, to who both had HIV and, and diabetes, spoke to me about constantly and, and very, very um, strictly following their um, medication for HIV, and it was provided by PEPFAR. But um, for the diabetes medication, they took it um, strategically. Um, and they did that because it was expensive. And so these decisions, and I think it kind of re-emulates this narrative of HIV in the early days, you know, that people can't medicate or, or care for their, di their HIV because of poverty. And that's just, you know, that's just baloney. In fact, you know, people were making strategic decisions to care for their diabetes because of financial burden. So is COVID-19 a syndemic? Um, Richard Horton called COVID-19 um, a syndemic in The Lancet. And, you know, he's he's right on that, that COVID-19 um, functions as a syndemic in many places. Although when he says COVID-19 is not a pandemic, it is not a syndemic, I took some issue because there has been this emergence of use of the idea of of a global syndemic, and that's an oxymoron because a global syndemic it cannot be a truism if, if a syndemic itself is like an epidemic, it runs through populations because calling a, synde a, a syndemic global erases the critical history um, and social and political factors and ecological factors that drive the clustering of diseases. And it takes away the onus of historical violence, for example, like structural violence, um, genocide, um, enslavement in, in cultivating um, risk and historic kind of segregations, for example, in the United States where I live um, and where many of, many of you do, may. Um, and so I, I responded to Richard Horton um, and suggesting that COVID-19 um, syndemic is not global, in fact, that context matters. Um, and I argued that it matters um, for multiple reasons. For example, in the United States, in my, where I live, of course, uh, COVID-19 is indeed syndemic. Um, and Lance Gravely wrote about this um, very powerfully, demonstrating how, you know, systemic racism, social environment pathway, and, you know, I would argue very strongly that political leadership um, imbued in how people thought about, responded to, interacted with, conceived of the disease itself and how then it concentrated and interacted with pre-existing conditions from um, diabetes to respiratory um, infections, disorders to hypertension to cardiometabolic, other cardiometabolic problems, as well as um, you know, chronic um, in, uh, in access to health care or financial insecurity, structural violence, um, and also disbelief and mistrust in our government that became embedded with how people thought about and responded to COVID-19 in the first place, which then um, COVID-19 infection um, and mor mortality became patterned, particularly afflicting Black and Native communities in the United States. That has been an extraordinary shame um, especially as the Global Health Security Index just a year before the pandemic in 2019 called the United States one of the most um, prepared um, nations to respond to any um, pandemic. Now, of course, the um, antidote to the uh, sluggish response of the United States is New Zealand. New Zealand responded, um, uh, of course, with female leadership and in a different vision for a small country of 5 million people. They responded with a firm hand and a closed border and um, an early quarantine. And by taking these strict public health interventionist measures, they prevented an outbreak and inherently the syndemic. COVID-19 was not syndemic in New Zealand. It also was not necessarily syndemic in Germany. Um, 
Now, there is some debate about the vaccine rollout, but um, in Germany, there was a much stronger response to COVID with more testing, containment, communication, and prevention of COVID-19 infections um, throughout 2020. And, you know, one of those kind of almost racist notions that we heard in the early um, part of 2020 that really went throughout the year is, you know, why are people in Sub-Saharan Africa not sicker? And this was this idea of, you know, should they be sicker? Um, you know, there's all of this um, kind of global health funding and attention to these areas. But in fact, many governments um, responded with a strong hand. Um, Rwanda is a really good example of a context where the government had an aggressive response, shut borders, um, encouraged, you know, education um, and and containment of the virus in, in an impressive way and in an exemplary way. So COVID-19 was not syndemic in Rwanda. And also in Rwanda with a more rural um, population and lower rates of cardiometabolic diseases, um, this was also of course played a role in, um, in COVID-19 not being syndemic there. So early on, I wrote about the COVID-19 as being potentially syndemic, um, and this was in March of, of 2020. And I argued that social policies made coronavirus worse because we already have these intensely patterned um, social inequities and health inequities that are mapped onto one another. And unfortunately, that was true. And that was revealed throughout the year that COVID-19 became syndemic because of these patterned inequalities. Um, and this is something that all of you know um, and that we can all understand. Um, and it's not going to get better unless we respond upstream. So why do syndemics matter? Syndemics change the way we think about disease. They, rec they make us recognize that diseases rarely exist in isolation. In fact, I've interviewed hundreds of people around the world, spent hours. Some of my interviews are up to six hours, and I've never met one person with one problem. I have never spent hours talking to someone without talking about one other social, psychological, or, or physical ailment that someone carries with them, and that may be diagnosed or undiagnosed, but what drives sickness is never alone. And identifying how and what social, political, economic, and ecological factors drive poor health is critical, and it's upstream. We have to look upstream, as well as thinking about iatrogenic factors. For example, that means, of course, when um, care itself make people sicker. Um, this good example of that is when, you know, providing a depressive med when, when to, to enhance someone's diabetes care causes um, some sickness um, or, or basically masks um, the true problem and, and the true affliction. So also determining how co-occurring co diseases, medications, social dynamics, clinical barriers also make people sicker. So understanding the most effective clinical and community-based interventions to mitigate syndemic interactions is crucial. So this involves both recognizing social policy as a key health intervention, as well as emphasizing the need for people-centered care. So uh, thinking through a transdisciplinary agenda is really how is, is focused on how people think about disease. Can we change how people think about, frame, communicate what makes people sick? It has to move beyond these, these narrow physical um, or, or um, pathological categories because it's much broader and social um, and interactive. We also need to bring together multiple fields of inquiry. We need sociologists, anthropologists, historians, biologists, nurses, public health practitioners, epidemiologists, clinicians, biostatisticians to come together and work together to think from ethnography to epidemiology. And we need to cultivate a comprehensive view of how syndemics emerge, converge, interact, how they change through time. What's syndemic today may not be syndemic tomorrow. It may not be syndemic in 30 years. Things change or it may be much more complicated. And we need to understand that and recognize that. Identify methods to identify syndemic concentrations and test syndemic interactions. Alex Sai, Timothy Newfield and I um, just edited a new special issue. The papers are out in the kind of collective is forthcoming on methods for testing and understanding syndemics. So please look for that in social science and medicine. And we need to take seriously this role of, of biological, psychological, and social interactions in quantitative analyses. And this is what's at the heart of the special issue. So how do we work from ethnography and then capture ethnographic ideas and understanding 
in quantitative social epi advanced modeling techniques. And we have a paper in review on my um, on an R21 I did with Alex Sai and Shane Norris um, on how to move from ethnography to epidemiology currently. So hopefully that should be out soon. So when we think about solutions, there's four levels of solutions that I generally argue and think about is, of course, upstream solutions I've talked a lot about from food policy, social, from school food policy, you know, what's in the food. Um, of course, in the United States, this comes down to sugar um, and many places around the world. What is in the food? How do we know how much sugar is in our food and how do we regulate that? How do consumers um, decide what to purchase? But of course, at the governmental level, what is permitted? Um, what is safe? What what produces um, a healthy population? And really thinking about people, I think the WHO is starting to call this a health tax rather than just a sugar or alcohol or um, a tobacco tax. Um, they were called sin taxes for a while, um, which is a bit victim blaming. So, you know, really thinking about where taxes can play a role. Also housing policy, improving access to safe housing, also legal counsel. Um, uh, there are some really good models of providing actually lawyers in clinical spaces where, um, for example, if mold is causing you to be sick, what is the solution is not medication, it's actually fixing the mold. So thinking about what kind of models of caregiving are crucial. Healthcare policy, obviously this is a huge uphill battle for the United States. There's many other models of universal healthcare that are much more robust, but access to safe, affordable, accessible healthcare is crucial for keeping people um, healthy and especially having an earlier diagnosis when people know that they're, for example, pre-diabetic, they're able to really think about how to care for themselves in a different way than when it's in a crisis so area. Um, minimum wage, making sure people are not constantly concerned where, about where their next meal is coming from, um, making sure that people have liv livable and equitable wages. And in many contexts, especially in the United States, immigration policy is key. So how do people work and feel safe um, and, and not carry fear with them in their everyday lives? Um, this can play a huge role in, in enhancing people's health and well-being. Clinical interventions, some kind of take-home messages are thinking about person-centered medical homes, um, who should be in in a clinical in a primary care setting, um, and how do people m work within multiple advantages of you know legal, social, physical, psychological dimensions of health? Incentivizing health providers for keeping people healthy. This is a good model from the United, from the U UK, where um, general practitioners are um, incentivized monetarily by um, how many people they keep out of the hospital. Medical teams also, you know, really focusing on mid-level health providers, enhancing um, what care nurses can provide. Um, in many contexts, family, um, uh, family practice, um, general practice is, um, you know, really needing a, a more robust workforce. And this can be built up through, um, through nurse practitioners and really giving more power um, and advocacy as well as through um, the, you know, nursing professional associations um, and, you know, really working through the nursing and physicians um, uh, professional associations to ensure a more equitable balance of power within wages, within care, within where people can work and what they can do. Also thinking about social workers and lawyers and clinical managers and psychologists and seeing who's on staff and who is given power and, and leverage and, and, and respect to do the critical work that they need to do. Um, and then also really thinking about house visits. This is something that has in many cases um, disappeared and it's crucial. We know from the super, super utilizer model in the United States where um, those who continue to return to emergency rooms are focused on, for example, homeless populations um, who are often living with extraordinary mental illness and distress um, where clinicians go to them and care for them where they are, which is a crucial, crucial lost practice um, around the world. Also community-based um, interventions are critical, especially for mental health, making sure people have counselors who speak their language um, and not just their emotional language, but their actual language, really hearing them in ways in which even if someone can speak some English, really hearing them in what their first language or their second language is, being able to care for people through the way that they speak and how they wanna share themselves or deepest um, um, stresses that they carry with them. Also house calls, being able to meet people in, in the community in their community centers, maybe their YMCA, 
Also, the, um, throughout COVID, apps and online telemedicine for mental health care has become really common and should continue after um, we go back to whatever is the new normal that we, we um, envision. And also, you know, the um, Alcoholics Anonymous model has become such a powerful one for talking about how people consume or, 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 um, or take on a new identity for healing. And for example, maybe using a diabetes um, care um, counseling group where people come talk about diabetes open when people kind of share backgrounds, shared languages, shared struggles, where then people can talk about finances. They can talk about different various experiences with trauma. They could talk about anxious feelings or, or stress about food and preparation and illness. Um, and these, these conversations, not just about diet, not just about exercise, not just about medication, move well beyond what can be done in the clinical space and being able to learn with others and share um, experiences can be very healing and, and overcoming. And also, you know, from COVID, we've learned how powerful rumor and confusing messages is and really getting to the heart of what context specific messages and issues are and how they conflate how people think about and care for themselves is so critical. And of course, downstream, um, really women's collective groups are so crucial for enhancing health of the community, financial planning, education, um, and then really taking seriously medical bankruptcy and um, medical bankruptcy forgiveness in the United States is absolutely crucial. Um, and community gardens, putting your hands in the dirt, um, not only enhances um, your mental health, it makes you move, it builds community. Um, community gardens should be a central um, intervention for all um, uh, community-based kind of wellness programs and lay leadership, providing small grants for people to apply to for community-led projects. Um, so letting people define what they want to build in their own community. Every community is different. Um, and even within communities, um, the young, the old, um, the working families, people have really different priorities and providing small grants to provide, for example, a meal or a snack or a space or a moment or, you know, being able to, uh, to fund a workshop. This can be absolutely critical to build um, health, healthy communities, to build um, healthy families. So letting people define what they need and what they want to build together on their own terms can be so crucial. So these ideas about what syndemics are and what they can do um, are just some of the examples um, that I've worked with and through, and I hope they're useful for you. Um, I'm happy to answer any e any questions that you have on email. I'm em. 1061 at georgetown.edu. It's been such a privilege to share this space and my work with you. Um, I wish you all well and thank you for spending this time. Wow, Emily, very powerful. Thank you so much for sharing your important insights and learnings about pandemics from all over the world. And it also perfectly complements what we learned from the previous keynotes. So thank you so much. I'll have a look at the q and I forgot to tell the audience that they should feel free to put any questions uh, in the Q&A also during your lecture. So please don't hesitate to answer questions. I can imagine a lot um, may have come up, but I don't see any questions yet. So maybe I can start. Well, this, your lecture, um, it makes clear that we should change the whole medical system, the whole public health system. And I really liked your suggestion to make the medical teams more multidisciplinary. What do you think? Should we also make the medical um, educational system more multidisciplinary? Hi, thanks. And um, everyone, please forgive me. I recorded the lecture earlier because I'm traveling um, and I'm in a rural part of America with my kids um, in the woods. So we just came out to do this. Um, yeah, so I would say that um, that everything starts with training. And when we think about um, building a health system, it, it starts with somewhat obviously barefoot doctors, community health, um, being there in the most rural and remote areas, but also bricks and mortar of teaching and training and building um, people who can provide care. And obviously that is critical in how people learn to think about bodies and people and communities. Um, so integrating um, 
you know, in, in shifting how um, people are taught to provide care and what care means um, is, is crucial. So um, I definitely agree. Um, there's been some really wonderful work on this um, by some anthropologists um, and others. So. Thank you. In the meantime, there is a question from Sandra Soto. Um, can you explain more about testing for interactions in Syndemic's work? Are you suggesting that for identifying a Syndemic, we should see a significant interaction analytically? Well, this is, this is a really good question. Um, so we have a number of papers out in social science and medicine in the special issue that we um, looked at. And we actually have another paper that's um, in a revise and resubmit that should provide a good example of what this looks like because um, how you test interactions um, is something that people have not Hello. The woods were too strong, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, it's um, our connection is not great, but um, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, the interaction. So in my first book, I kind of show what that looks like at the individual level, but syndemics are not um, individual level theories. There's a lot of theory um, and, and framing from social suffering to intersectionality that provides really in-depth historical and political commentary and understanding of how people experience and embody disease or illness or, um, or health. Um, what we're trying to do with syndemics is to apply a, a more in-depth interpretation of what health and illness means, but at a population level view. And I think it's really important to think about that. And so Alex Sai came out with a bunch of critiques on what this looks like and, and really where syndemic thinking has, um, has failed. Um, in 2015, he had a, a critique in social science and medicine and Ron Stahl kind of responded to him and they had this great dialogue and, and Alex has been written, has written pretty extensively on it since then. And so Alex and I with Timothy Newfield did the special issue in part to encourage people to innovatively think of how we can test these interactions. Because you bring up this important point that it's very difficult and complicated to actually do that, which is what impedes some work on thinking about is something actually syndemic. So um, a lot of the work has looked at just the coexistence of conditions and not the interactions themselves. So um, structural equational mo mo uh, modeling has been really essential. Um, to looking at these interactions. We, um, in the new paper that's in review, we looked at, um, we built actually a um, stress scale and a coping scale from our ethnographic work. And then we interviewed a thousand people with that scale. Um, and we found that actually stress was a powerful mediator, mediator of quality of life. So our outcome was not the disease. The out, I mean, the outcome is the syndemic, um, but in, in measuring that and looking at interactions, um, because it's not a, syndemics are not just about comorbidity or multimorbidity. They're about the interactions of those conditions with the social world or climate or um, political factors, you know, so really taking that seriously. But how do you capture those factors? It's very complicated um, and not cl that clear. So that's what we've been trying to do with a special issue. And I'm happy to share that work, especially when it comes out hopefully soon um, with how we've been conceptualizing that and also share all the papers from the special issue um, I can, you know, share it um, through the conference site um, to look at how people have innovatively looked at these interactions, which I think is, it's, um, it's moving the needle and thinking about what this means, 
Um, but also thinking about that, what that means and how that reflects policy or how that can influence policy is is also tricky. In our um, in our revise and resubmit, people were really critical about, well, what does this mean? Like, what does it mean when you you found that potentially um, interventions in the community or in the church could be more powerful than the clinic? Well, what does that mean? That's a radical transformation of how care is, con is considered, talked about, structured. Um, and you know it it is a reality. It's but you know as in we know especially from COVID, you know even though you have the best science and evidence, it doesn't mean that there's the political um, uh, influence or or um, or will to or, or interest to, to make that happen. So oh, I see another question. Yeah, another questions are coming in uh, from Antonio Palmira. Some colleagues in my research group talk about spillover effects on behaviors such as physical activity and nutrition, engaging in a healthy, for, uh, I think a word is missing, in healthy nutrition leads to others to follow through. Can you com comment on this? And if we tackle one epidemic, we may expect others to be sorted out also? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, when I think about um, behavior, I think about um, the overdetermination of behavior. Um, I don't think that people can always or do always do things because of individual interest or passion or disinterest. Um, I think that our behaviors and our movements are structured um, and politically determined and socially framed. So um, for example, if you are not walking for example, a lot of my work um, of women, especially living in urban spaces, um, their decisions to eat certain foods are not individually, but family linked. Um, and, you know, Vikram Patel writes a lot about this in the global mental health literature is like, we can't, and I've had some conversations with them about this is that actually, for example, if you're working in more pro-social societies, if you're working specifically like in Goa where he works, you can't really actually look at the individual. You have to look at the family unit um, if you're going to think systemically. So, you know, what does individual behavior change mean? I think it means that we need to look broadly and that behavior is is a reflection of the problem. Um, and it's not something that can necessarily always be tackled. And if you go upstream and tackle, you know, what's in the food that's provided, how stressful people's lives are, um, you know, what, you know, these broader, bigger societal issues, um, then you can transform all of these epidemics. We know um, that's really powerful. There, I don't know if people are following the um, the Alliance for Health Systems and WHO have a new call for health taxes. And I really think about, um, especially when we're thinking about problems like diabetes, um, you know, what is provided and at what cost and, and what's even made, what kinds of food are made and easily accessible and why. Um, getting to the heart of, of, of those questions, urban planning is probably the most important thing to think about when we're thinking about um, tackling multiple epidemics at once. And so, you know, again, social policy is so crucial um, and we can't educate away obesity, for example, it's just not going to happen. Um, and that's because people have real challenges, including, you know, gender plays such a huge part of feeling safe. Feeling safe is just something I find all around the world you know, carrying stress. Diabetes is, is, a, is a reflection of six pathways at least, you know, linking to stress um, also in these various ways. So when we just look at sugar, for example, um, it just erases these very personal experiences. Um, it's, is that sufficient? I think I answered that. Maybe I'll go to the next one real quick. I wonder if you're familiar with the Unitas effort. Yeah, the next question is from Kim Gantz. I wonder if you're familiar with the UNITE US effort in the USA that is adding social determinants of health to the medical record and then links patients to community resources with a feedback loop back to providers. Wondering about your thoughts on these types of efforts. I think those are wonderful efforts. I don't think they're enough, but I think they are excellent. For example, um, not unlike this, um, Lucy Marcel is a physician in Boston who um, has in her clinic, um, someone, it's a, she's a pediatrician, but in her clinic, she has someone who will do your taxes, who will help you do your taxes. And she's found that having that individual working with families in her clinic, families can reclaim enough money to um, pay for food for a year, for healthier diets for their families and healthier foods for their families for an entire year, which, you know, fights food insecurity. Um, there's a lot of really remarkable ways in which we can mitigate um, you know, the U.S. has a 
has very few social safety nets um, for low income working poor families. Um, and, you know, getting to the heart of that at the clinic, the clinic can be, um, if we thought, a, a really transformative space. Um, and it is in some cases, there's a million examples of incredible physicians. I remember when we um, doing this work, you know, at the front lines doing this work, recognizing the insufficient social policies that we have. Um, and this is around the world. There's amazing um, programs coming to try to ameliorate the um, really harmful policies we have in place. And part of this is neoliberal capitalism um, and, and framing our societies based on profit and not people. Um, this is what we see again and again. But, you know, really thinking about changing the system is the solution. And, you know, we know that people have been writing about that for years. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know, part of it, especially being an American, is thinking about um, more scientists running for office um, to really affect change and, and transform these, these challenges. But, um, you know, um, I think that really having these folks in, in clinics can be transformative, especially having a lawyer We've been doing a, just one more comment. We um, have been doing a little work and I have a, um, Rani Mishori is a colleague of mine who does this really important work on um, on combining, you know, having lawyers available in clinics, um, especially for migrants in the US and asylees, asylees and refugees and, um, and labor migrants, in part because, um, especially for asylees being able to write and, and document people's trauma or their, uh, you know, why they have left and why they're seeking refuge. Um, and, you know, having, having either the um, psychiatrist or general practitioners in, for example, Ayuda is a clinic we've worked with, and I have a colleague who runs part of that project in DC, where they um, really need um, mental health care providers on site because the um, the clients are not going to be seeking care in formal medical settings because they they don't have documentation. But actually at Ayuda, they have safe havens and opportunities to get that care. So having physicians, not only having a lawyer in the clinic, but also having physicians, care providers who can be available in settings that are safe, non-medical spaces to provide, for example, psychological care, um, trauma-based um, care, even if it's short term, can make a really big difference. Also, um, you know, having really organized nurse midwife or and, you know, large nurse general practitioner and um, nurse practitioner practices in like the YMCA. So you're not going to a physical healthcare setting, but you're getting care where you need it. Like minute clinics are making a pretty big impact. Um, also, um, you know, just having um, urgent care available is pretty transformative outside of the formal settings that are really exclusive, have made big impacts around the world. Thank you so much, Emily. I don't see any questions and time is also running. So I would really like to thank you again for this very valuable contribution and the nice discussion. And thank you also ISMAPA audience for participating and I hope you all enjoy ISMAPA Exchange. So I wish you all the best. Thanks and have a nice day wherever you are. <laughs>